Hello and welcome to our first Summit Masterclass. I hope everybody enjoyed our virtual summit last week. It's not quite the same seeing you all in person, but it went very well. My name is Will Nelson. I'm Senior Business Development Manager at ACS. And today's session will be focused on how to make local products a star like Southern Co-op. With consumers being more conscious of the environment and values, local suppliers have become more and more important to retailers' businesses. This masterclass will hopefully give you a better understanding of how retailers work with local suppliers and how it's benefited their stores. This masterclass has also been kindly sponsored by Southern Co-op. You will shortly hear a presentation from Simon Eastwood, Chief Operating Officer of Retail at Southern Co-op, and that will then be followed by a panel session with myself chairing and Simon, Dean Holborn of Holborns and Avtar Sidhu, Sid, as many of you know him, from St. John's Budgeons in Kenilworth. If you have any questions throughout Simon's presentation or throughout the retailer panel, then please feel free to ask them in the box below and use the code ACS. I will now hand you over to Simon Eastwood from Southern Co-op, who will talk about how they work with local supplies and source local products. Good afternoon. My name is Simon Eastwood, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer Retail for Southern Co-op Food Stores. To give you some very brief background on the company, we trade south of the M4 across nine counties, and we run, in the main, convenience stores. I'm here today to talk to you about how to make local product a hero in your stores. So why local sourcing? Well, for us, it supports our business ethos, which is all about working with communities, trading in communities, and giving something back to those communities in partnership. Buying locally absolutely helps support small business, and local employment. Indeed, we have a number of examples where we have worked in partnership with small businesses who have started as a husband and wife team and over time have developed their business from two people to four people to eight people and beyond. We know that in today's world, customers expect a number of things from the food retailer that they shop with. They expect some specialist product they expect governance. They want to know where food is coming from. Provenance is ever more important. Alongside sustainability, environment. Some of our suppliers, some of the smaller suppliers indeed, are actually industry leading, cutting edge on things like environmental and sustainability issues. The road miles taken to deliver to stores are minimal, and lots of the packaging is 100% fully recyclable. So what is local sourcing? For us, it's about finding products that fill range gaps and it's sourcing products in a home county that we then look to retail in that county or the next county to it. So we're looking to be truly local. I must be very clear and it's really important thing to say, we don't use local product to replace the great product we all already get from our supply base. This is all about complementary product, all about understanding the customer demographic, and all about filling those small range gaps that we may have. The mutual benefit in terms of working in part partnership is there for all to see. Employment, local reputation, and indeed, if we think about the coronavirus and customers shopping more locally and the threats to employment in today's world, our view is this becomes ever more important. We work with 179 suppliers and we retail nearly 2000 individual items as part of our local offer. Clearly no store has that many. Some of the businesses that we work with are businesses like Cook Frozen Food, a fantastic, high-end frozen food operator that make really good quality product. And they retail their product in a number of stores. They have their own standalone stores. They operate out of garden centers, center parks with ourselves and another, a, a number of other operators. For those folks, they don't need our advice about retail pack, how to bring their great product to market. 
But if we go back to the husband and wife team that I talked about earlier, we have partnerships with microbreweries that produce just two items. And in those instances, many of these businesses have never brought their product to market. Therefore, we work with them to help them understand how their factory needs to be set up, some of the rules around sustainability, how to price their product, and how to get the right retail pack. We have a real focus on community support as part of our local program. The three examples that are in front of you are just three great examples of some of the things we've done recently over the last couple of years. Isle of Wight Milk is a partnership that we developed with a farmer on the Isle of Wight and has really supported the farming industry over there. Free carrier bags for the Royal Navy, or selling carrier bags for the Royal Navy Marines charity. Absolutely no profit in that for us, but absolutely the right thing to do. And the Pompey Pale Ale, again, raising money for a local charity in Portsmouth. In terms of in-store environment, this has really changed over the years for us. We're now in our 14th year of selling local products. And we've had lots of thoughts about whether it's best to merchandise local product in its base category or actually to merchandise it separately. Our current thinking and latest thinking is that we want to make local product a real hero in our stores. We rebranded a couple of years ago, modernized the brand, and we've made it a real point of difference in our store estate. At the same time, we made the decision to merchandise our local product together. So chill product and ambient product in a run, in a specific area of the store with extra lighting. And the feedback from our customers has been fantastic. In fact, often they ask us for more products and bring ideas to us that we haven't thought of. And finally, we look to build partnerships. We would always have done this physically up until and before March this year when coronavirus struck. We are now doing many of the same things, but we're doing it via technology, the same as we are today. The top picture there is you can see a meet the buyer event where we either invite local suppliers that we have interest in or local suppliers who have written to us come in and they pitch their product. They bring their product to us. They talk about it, they talk about the price of it, the value of it, the market that they work in. It's a little like a friendly dragon's den is how I would describe it. But we get great value out of those sessions. And I know our supply base do, our partners do. And at the bottom there, you can see Cook Frozen Food. So just an example of the execution of that in one of our stores. So to sum up, local food is a huge part of our business. It's a significant part of our turnover and we really enjoy working with our local supply base to find and understand their best and most innovative products and also to help the smaller ones of those local suppliers find new routes to market. Thanks very much. Thank you for that, Simon. It was great, great to hear how you work with local suppliers. We're pleased to say now joined with, by uh, Dean Holborn of Holborn Stores and Sid from Kenilworth and Budgeons. So a good place to start, I suppose, guys, would be with you, Dean, to actually um, ask how you currently work with local suppliers and, and what type of products you stock. Um, good afternoon, everyone. We, um, we've worked with local suppliers for years, well, for a number of years now. But I've brought a couple of samples, actually, to show. So one of them is... Um, the village where we are is Nutfield and just recently a farmer started his own dairy. Um, again, it's obviously in a reusable bottle, so there's a deposit return on that. Um, it retails at 150 for a, whatever that is, uh, I can't remember, a litre. It's a quite a dearer than a normal bottle. But obviously there's a sustainability issue, um, not issue, but sustainability um, offering in that as well. So people like it, they like the fact that they can return the bottle. They're like they're, they're buying into something local. There's another company we use, which is um, Shortfield Bread, which is like an artisan uh, bread. And the collaboration with them, obviously, through throughout the uh, lockdown, was amazing because whilst you know the constraints on bread from the main from our main supplier 
Warburton's, as much as they delivered every day, Chalk Hills were delivering in excess of 100 loaves a day to us, to both stores, um, without any problem. So that sort of uh, relationship with Chalk Hills and the local dairy has been uh, immense during this, these troubled times. Yeah, and I suppose, yeah, like you say, the last, last few months have been difficult with supply chains and things. So people have, especially retailers, had to rely on local suppliers. So those relationships are very important. So, and, and Sid, how do you currently work with, with local suppliers? Yeah, we've been working with local suppliers for quite a while. Um, and it's, you know, an instrumental part of the business. Um, and as Dean said, uh, through... You know, no, no one could, you know, foreseen what we've been through in the last six to eight months. And lockdown kind of put us in a position that we've, you know, it has been unprecedented that we haven't put into that place ever before. So it's really interesting how we kind of, you know, different people have risen to the challenges. And the local supply chains that we had were really, really, you know, they really helped us through to make sure that we... You know, our role in all of this was to make sure that we got food, you know, food was available, you know, for our local communities. And, you know, the, the local suppliers, not only did they get full, but they actually kind of went above and beyond. And, you know, we, we were getting deliveries, as Dean said, from a number of different key suppliers, from flour mills, from local bakeries, um, honey producers, uh, there's all, you know, I could go on. Our egg supplier was delivering three times a week, you know. It was just phenomenal, really, how everybody just actually responded amazingly well. And I think one of the key key attributes about that was, because it's all a very hyper-local, you know, we all operate geophysically within a, a small area. Um, and, you know, and as we were existing customers, and it was really interesting that, you know, some of these suppliers were asked by, you know, larger supply chains, actually, if they could supply them during that period. And, and they felt that actually they probably wouldn't be able to fulfill. Yeah. And they, they wanted to make sure that they looked after their, you know, the, yeah. you know, the customers that they've always had, you know. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's been great. And, and I think for me, yeah. you know, similar thing to what Simon says, you know, we go through a process with suppliers. It's got to tick a certain number of boxes. And, you know, making sure that we can get consistency of supply is very, very important. Yeah. You know, it's, it's great getting the right product. It's great getting the right kind of within the right categories of the store. But we really need consistency across the board. Uh, and that's not only on uh, making sure we can get availability week on week, but also price. You know, we kind of set a price and we agree for a year. Um, and that works really well. Yeah, no, that's, I think price can be quite quite important as well when it comes to, to customers and and the downturn in the economy. That might be a thing going forward. But, but Simon, that video, was, that was great, how you work with local suppliers. It gave it was great insight into all the work you do with them. I've had a question come in to actually ask about what the average footprint of your, your stores across the state is and how many lines would you roughly find in your average C store? Total lines or local lines? Local lines, yeah. Okay. So the average footprint is somewhere between about, probably about 2,500 square feet. Um, we can get our whole offer into 2,350 square feet uh, and trade up to about 3,000 square feet. We have um, a store on the Isle of Wight which takes circa 600 local lines, but that's a bigger unit. And the mm -hmm. average would be 50 and a couple of hundred across various categories. Do you see? Do you see that's driven by by customers, or is that both retail and customers? For us, we we overlay um, demographic profiles. So whenever we set up or, or or open a new store, we look at where the store is, who the customer is, what the affluence is, and then we consider the local product that we have available to us. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it won't surprise um, the folk listening to know that if you take six centre stores as an example. Outside of food to go, which works relatively well in those locations, other products tend to work so well in those locations. But in the more rural community based stores, it works really well. So it's absolutely critical that you put the right product in the right store. What I would yeah. say to everybody is talk to your supply base. You know, the suppliers really understand their brand 
their product and their customer. Um, and actually, in many ways, they guide us. You know, they talk to us about where they think their product would fit best for us. Yeah, and as, you know, like you say, dem- demographics, location are, are key to, to drive these things. Um, coming back to you, Dean, uh, how do you, we heard Simon say like a, they're a Dragon's Den approach to, to finding new, new businesses and suppliers to work with. How do you go around sourcing those, those local suppliers? Um, if I'm honest, they tend to find us. We've got a good reputation locally. Um, as our, you know, our shops are quite unique looking. So we have tables in our stores where we um, display, you know, it could be a promotion. It could be something that's a bit different. So they tend to find us. They come, you know, they know we, our stores are nice looking and they want to be associated with us. So over the years, we found people will, on the whole, come and find us. Um, and then it's, it can be quite hard because obviously these people might be customers and they think they've got this product that's is amazing and you look at it and you think, that's not going to sell or yeah, yeah. That in my shop. But um, but that's how we tend to find. Um, we should be, able, we probably should be more proactive. Sometimes I'll be in shops, I'll be honest, I'll, you know, we know we have nice farm shops near us, so I'll go and do my homework there, go to a farm shop, as you do with any other business, go and have a look, see if you can pick up some ideas. Um, and then there's the sort of, there's the other products like, you know, sort of like the, the Darlington's, the sort of, they're not local, but they're, they're not a huge, huge brand, are they? You know, so, so we tend to, you know, use them a lot as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, Simon, was, you were saying about how far, like, the radius is for actually to classify a local product. If we come to uh, see it, what, what would your customers consider local and would it go a bit further afield for, for yourself or would you stay quite, quite close to the community? It's an interesting question, actually, because I think if you look at local, it's divided into either hyper-local or local. And a lot of people, when they say local, they automatically imagine that it's from Kenilworth, you know, from the yeah. you know, one actually within a two, three mile radius. And that, you know, that's impossible. You know, that, that we certainly have supplies within that. You know, our local baker, our honey is from the castle. Um, you know, uh, we've got a local gin. But, you know, beyond that, yeah, no, we, we, we kind of, give or take 20, 25 mile radius. It's got to be within Warwickshire. That's probably one of the key things okay. for me. Um, and actually, it's it's really to augment, um, you know, the ranges we have in store. You know, and some of these things, you know, we'll go to food festivals. Um, you know, actually, in some cases, customers will come and tell us about a product they've tried, maybe at a farm shop or somewhere else. And, you know, could we maybe have a look at it, source it in? Um, and we'll, in, you know, get, it, get in touch with the supplier but really, it's, it's you know, got to be within a certain kind of confinement. And, um, you know, f- food miles is very much on the agenda, you know, because people are aware, you know, the, the community at large are aware. Uh, and one of the reasons of bringing uh, local products in is to make sure that we can kind of, it's a sustainable way of, you know, bringing in a new business, you know, it's all within a yeah. local area. So it's... Um, yeah. And when, and when it comes to merchandising these products in store. Simon, you, you had that great display in your stores which, which showcased those local products brilliantly. Did you see a massive uplift in sales when you when you came to do that compared to just putting them in the base category? Yeah, well, we moved from base category to um, individual areas, so frozen, ambient, and chilled, and that worked reasonably, but actually got the biggest pickup where we specifically put aside an area in the store and we branded the whole thing as local, we put the right type of um, lighting in, shelving in, rebranded that that sort of subcategory of local foods. Also did shelf talkers talking about the provenance and the story of the local supplier because we find that customers are really interested in the family history of some of these businesses, particularly the small to medium ones, and we saw a, a significant uplift. Um, we started out, gosh, 14 years ago with a view that said we'd like this percentage of different categories to be to be local, uh, you know, the percentage of total sales. We have a different view now. We tend to, to rely on our local suppliers to tell us about what's new in the market, their insight. And, and interestingly, in today's world, if you took ambient, frozen, chill, and wines and spirits, they they each have about an equal proportion of our local of our local business. 
So it's really quite widely spread across our stores. And we have lots of stores that have no food to go and some stores that have no growth, yeah. vice versa. So, yeah, we pick and choose. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Dean, I suppose when it comes to certain, certain cat, categories with, with local suppliers, are there some that work well and others that you try to stay, stay clear of? Um, yeah, some do work very well. We use a local butcher. So you might not argue that's local, you know, the meat might not be local, but it's, it's, you're, you're involving yourself with a small butcher. Again, that works very well because it's on a salary term basis. He gives us the margin and he gives us the delivery six days a week. So those sort of categories work, you know, that works exceptionally well for us. Um, it complements our, our range from Blakemore. So obviously we still got the Blakemore range, like the meat market range, which is a good product. But obviously once people obviously you know, try something that's from a butcher, you, you're, you're building confidence there with them on that basis. Yeah, yeah. And it's and keeping the community that kind of feel as well, which which now customers want to keep things local and have that Very kind of so, yeah. interaction with those guys as well. So it's great. And and Sid, do you um do anything special with local produce, produce in your store? Do you have a the table display like Dean or a certain section or is it mainly in the categories? Yeah, no, a bit a mixture actually. You know, there's a bit of a mixture. Um, but yeah, we have a local ale, complete bay full of uh, local ales. Um, I think it's very important, you know, to bring uh, local produce, local product to life. You know, you really need to make your fixture stand out. You know, for it to become, you know, yeah. integral within your store. And um, you know, we have we have a table in front of the store with a, a local baker actually within Kennelworth called Andrew Davis. We've got him to make, you know, POS for him, you know, a, a stand, a, like a, a big uh, poster above uh, with points from the ceilings. And um, so, we, you know, we really go make a lot of effort into, any, you know, all of these things that come into store, there's a lot of effort gone behind to make sure that we launch it correctly. And then going on from there, you know, we've got ongoing support, you know, so it might mean that we look at in-store tastings. Obviously, that hasn't happened, you know, lately, but that's, that yeah. is all part and pars parcel of when we first look at bringing in a local supplier. Uh, and in some case, you know, in a lot of the cases, actually, we've made custom-made um, POS banners, branding uh, for our store. You know, that's been part of making sure that, you know, of, bringing in, you know, some of these uh, products within the store. Um, yeah, so looking at the uh, the in-store theatre and trying to get that engagement is, is it, crucial. I think it's vital, actually, and I think it does, it does actually a bit of a, you know, you, you make a lot of effort looking for these suppliers and your customers actually are looking to buy into them, but you need to do your part to make sure that your execution is first rate. You know, it yeah. looks the part, it's done properly, executed properly. And you're actually bringing that section to life, you know. You need to kind of sex you up certain categories within the store. Uh, and some of these products really need to jump out at consumers and, and really kind of drive the whole category in many ways. You know, if it distracts them in certain parts of the store, you know, they get some stop and look and, and look at other parts of your proposition. I think it's a big win. So yeah, you know, we've done a local paste and curry sauces um, and we put them right next to the chiller in a custom made stand yeah. uh, and that's worked phenomenally well you know the amount of cases we've sold you know we've, we've only had it in for a couple of months you know i had to order a, a pallet of this stuff and uh you know we've we've probably gone through a quarter of a pallet already it's, yeah it's yeah that's, that's, that's great uh so i've got a question coming in for you about uh sales so Someone's asked, what is the, the percentage of sales of local versus the core category? And is this growing? Absolutely. Refuse to share commercial information. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it is growing. It's a significant portion of our, of our business locals. But I, I don't really want to share the... the, yeah. the, the <laughs> it's a multi-million business. So 10 million and uh, 2 million in turnover. Yeah. Um, yeah. Works, works well growing well I, I would i would absolutely back up what the two other guys said i think through covid coronavirus so many customers forced to stay close to home the big four in the early days didn't do a great job 
came and tried their local convenience store and were quite surprised at one, the breadth of normal range and value that was in those convenience outlets, but secondly, the type of local product we had. And whilst we've not added lots of new suppliers in, in the in the sort of the lockdown or through the last, what we have done is we've had suppliers that have doubled or tripled the number of stores that they've supplied to. So we took a bit of a punt. Um, and, uh, you know, the example that the, the guys, guys gave around, you know, suppliers stepping up, more deliveries a week, more stores. We've done all of that. And that's really helped grow the category. We're about 20% up on local this year, year to date. Of how what, what a good year we've had with our, our supply day. Yeah, and I, I suppose Simon, when you when you are considering the local suppliers, are there any practicalities that you you kind of have to look at, like maybe the price of the products, the the waste maybe involved, seasonality, those kind of things. Yeah, well, we we come from a we come from a, an angle on this that if you think about the um, uh, some of the bad press that some of the big retailers get around G stop and not treating suppliers very well, mm. we have all suppliers that we're in this if we enter into a relationship it will be a minimum of a year to 18 months and if we want to exit a relationship again it will be a minimum of a year and we will work with that supplier to help reformulate the product rethink about repricing, packaging etc um, we have a, an assurance scheme so we use a third party uh, assurer in terms of food assurance and provenance and, and sort of quality of the factory uh, and again, dependent on the supplier, sometimes we'll pick up the tab for that. Other times, the supplier, they'll pick up the tab for that because we're really keen to make this a positive and a partnership experience from the, the very largest type of supplier we've got right down to the very smallest. And you have yeah. Cook, for example. It's a, it's a renowned company. We treat that as a regional supplier rather than a local supplier. So that, you know, they, they trade across that, the whole of the South Road. So they're not really, they're more, but we don't need worry about assurance putting something in um, to do that they've got all those things set up themselves but the couple that run a, a microbrewery need some help and and um, you know those assurers go in and they also provide coaching direction help it's not it's not a sort of a, a tick box exercise and a marking exercise it's, it's how do we help you get your product to market yeah so it's giving them that added, added support and making sure it's not just a, a short-term thing and you're actually there for a bit more of the long run which is great to hear. Um, coming back to you, Dean, um, we've obviously talk, talked about what our shoppers' key, key drivers to buying local, and we talked about the quality, community, heritage, things like that. Do you think environment, sustainability is playing a key role now? Um, very much, yeah. Yeah, I mean, as I said with the milk, um, the fact that we can offer, it's not going to take over our milk sales, it's not going to, but you, I have to go around the village, you know, and I see those bottles around, you know, I went to deliver some flowers yesterday and they only had the bottles in a step because the chap delivers in the village as well. And that, I was sort of, do I put that into the business because it's being delivered locally? Do I need to be messing about with deposit return? But, you know, it ticks the box. People like it. People, it's special to them. We had um, some Nutfield wine this year. That was fantastic. It was just, this guy had a small vineyard locally. He came to me. And it just was right in the middle of the lockdown. It was just people really, really, we just couldn't get enough of it and sold, sold his complete stock. So obviously it'll be harvesting soon. And uh, we'll have the, ro there's a rosé and a white on the shelf. He literally just, I, I kid you not, like less than a mile from where I'm sitting now, he's produced it. So brilliant. <laughs> yeah. That's people good. Yeah. And, and Sid, do you, do you see that in your, your area as well? It's, it is about... Customers have more values and, and are worried more about where, where products are coming from. Very much so. Uh, I think customers more than ever, you know, environmentally, socially, the impact, you know, some of our actions have, you know, um, in many different ways, whether it's plastic, whether it's air miles, food miles, uh, the provenance of the product. You know, there's a number of different factors that go into play. And, and I think local really kind of captures that whole uh, movement and I think it's crucial you know people get behind local and support local in many different ways um, and commercially actually it's the right thing to do you know it adds a, a kind of completely unique proposition to your store in some in some ways you know you can play a role by safeguarding that you know by having local trading agreements um, 
you know, for your particular sites. And, you know, for me, we, we, I couldn't see any other which way to operate, you know, without a considerable uh, range of local products, you know, from, you know, in our store. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose we touched, we touched a little bit on, on COVID and the impacts, impacts of that and you, you guys working with more local suppliers. But um, Simon, I suppose customers can tend, tend to perceive local maybe as being more of a premium item. Do you think going forward that this could be, I suppose this could hit sales because of the current economy and and maybe they have to reduce what they spend so they'll look at, at going maybe for a cheaper alternative? Yeah, I think it's an interesting challenge. My view is no, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Because I think firstly, if you put the right product in the right store and the right demographic and the right affluence, you're halfway there. I also think most customers want to treat themselves once in a while. And I think, you know, a customer in most of most of the convenience estates in the UK can get value products, can get entry price point products, but can also get something relatively special. And I think it's about customer choice. Um, the one thing that we do work with our local supply base on, particularly if we get high waste numbers, is retail pack size. And I think that's that's something that's always an angle to look at. Um, we had a we had a a, a partnership with a, a farmer uh, who produced meat products, and it was we made a real real mistake if I'm honest. It was three years ago, where we we retailed it in sort of vacuum bags, so it wasn't retail pack, it wasn't ideal. Okay. For sure. And guess what? Number one, it didn't sell. Number two, it got nicked. Uh, and you know, after quite a lot of pain, we looked at it and thought that was a really daft decision. So making sure that it looks good on shelf and it's the right price and presented in the right way, I think is half the battle. So I think customers will always want another alternative and are happy to invest some of their money if they know it's supporting the local community. I think that's key. Yeah, that's great. Well, we're going to have to start wrapping up in a minute. So I suppose one one final question to ask these of you is, uh, I suppose starting with Dean, if is there any top tips you could give to, to retailers watching this about how to source local products or how to how to work better with local suppliers? Um, probably like I said, you, you know, do your homework, go, maybe go look locally, go to nice farm shops, whatever, you know, decide what you want to look at, whether it's alcohol, whether it's a beer supplier, um, you don't have to maybe, well, use the internet to source local products and source local companies. Again, you know, we use uh, Twitter and Facebook to advertise our, um, our local products. And you tend to find pe uh, people on that, yeah, especially on Twitter, because it's business to business. You find people champion local products. So I'd use the internet locally and then find what you want to, you know, which you think, as Simon said, is the right demographic for your store. So your store, it might not necessarily be about um, bread. It might be more alcohol orientated. So find something locally, you know, invest the time into... Um, uh, local beers yes yeah and would you say that too Sid so in your in your store you'd you'd say I suppose a cat's breed to start at could be something like your ales or something local like that yeah I think it's all part and parcel of you know the way you operate in your local community and uh, you know your customers can support you as a local business and it's only right and it's the right thing to do as well you know for you to look around and support local businesses in and around the area that you operate you know, so, so, you know, any retailer, I'd, I highly kind of get them to, you know, rethink and, you know, look at areas of your store. Every store is different depending where, you know, geophysically your stores are. Just look at areas that you think that you can add value. Um, you know, there's, there's kind of value to be driven in every category within the store. But instead, you know, pick a few categories that you think are, you know, real hero categories for your particular location. You know, and start there, you know, look at some of the suppliers within your area and go through a process of making sure that they, you know, they can, they can come up with products or have products that kind of can fill these uh, gaps and, yeah. you know, drive that, uh, drive that kind of additional pur purchase. Yeah. And, and Simon, just to finish it off. So have you got any, any, any tips for retailers as well? No, I think, the, I think the guys have said two of the key things, network, 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 you know, um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, social media, that's the new avenue. And I'd absolutely support that. 
you know, we have, a, we have an organization in ACS that has lots of local suppliers that come on. So network with those folks, you know, talk to them and understand some of their products. We've met people through ACS who now produce and supply product to our stores. And then I think there are lots of shows. You know, we, we're part of the Royal Agricultural Society on the Isle of Wight. We're part of Hampshire Fair, Sussex Food and Drink. You know, those things are that, that you, you go to those events and present or, or you're part of them. And you could end up with a hundred local suppliers talking about their product. So put yourself out there. I, I support everything the guys have said. Yeah, that's that sounds like a good a good message to take away is to is to network and make sure you are, you're on those platforms to to find those local project producers. And to, yeah, it's great. So that's that's all we've got time for, unfortunately. So I'd just like to say a big thank you to to Simon, Dean, and Sid to be on this panel. It's a great discussion we've had there. We're going to now take a short break. And our next session will be starting at 3 p.m., which is going to be focused on how to reduce plastic packaging like Thornton's budget. So we're at a 10-minute break and then and then we'll be back after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.
Hello and welcome to the how-to session on plastic packaging. As we all know, plastic is high on the agenda, especially since Blue Planet 2 and the government are facing increasing pressure to tackle and reduce plastic waste. But it's not just the government facing pressure to do something. Businesses are also part of this, with customers increasingly expecting retailers to play their part in reducing plastic. I'm Eleanor O'Connell from the Association of Convenience Stores. As you may know, ACS works on the government's plans to introduce environmental policy and the impact of this on small shops. Today, we're specifically looking at how to stop plastic being generated, rather than looking at how to tackle plastic waste. We're going to speak to retailers with experience in this, who've taken the plunge towards going plastic free, as well as hearing from a supplier in the field to look at how to practically go about reducing plastic packaging. So first, we're going to hear from Andrew Thornton, founder at Thornton's Budgeons in London, before we're joined by panelist Rachel Hockmeyer from Hockmeyer's Spa Sleaford in Lincolnshire, and James Perry, CEO and founder of Loco Soku, who I'd like to thank for kindly sponsoring this session. If you want to write questions, you can do so in the box below, and the code is ACS. Good morning. Um, welcome to this Zoom session. It feels a bit strange. I'm sort of talking into a, a, a camera this morning, and there's no one there. But anyway, uh, I'm here today wearing two hats. As an independent retailer, the owner of Thornton's Budgets in Belsize Park, and also having founded an organisation called Heart in Business, which is about looking at alternatives ways to run businesses that are less focused on profit and more focused on, on, on people. Um, when I first accepted the invitation to do this, COVID was something we'd no one, no one of us had ever heard of. Um, and around that time, I was talking at events about major challenges. So on the next slide, uh, I kind of summarises some of the things that were going on in consumers' heads for the last couple of years. And really driven by David Attenborough, the level of awareness, both about the plastic challenge and the environmental, the climate crisis had dramatically increased. And suddenly, thanks to David Attenborough and a blue planet, these things were in people's living rooms and customers were starting to care about it in a way they never had before. And at the other end of the spectrum, Greta has captured people's imagination and has uh, brought the same issues, particularly the climate crisis, into people's living room. Now that's relevant to you and I, because our customers are these people, and suddenly having been probably a bit in denial about the climate crisis and the plastic crisis, customers two years ago or so, a bit more than that, really started to get interested and wanted retailers to make their life easier by helping them address these issues. So Moving forward to where we are now, in the middle of this COVID crisis, um, what's changed? Well, for most independent retailers, COVID has been really good because it has brought people back into local communities. So for the sector, it's, it's been a, a positive. It's one of the few sectors that has had a positive business impact out of, out of COVID. We still face the cost-based challenges that we've faced for some considerable time with ever increasing rents, rates, wages, and, and other costs. Um, from a consumer point of view, the two big environmental uh, broad challenges I talked about a minute ago, COVID's affected both of them, I believe. With the climate crisis, there's no doubt that the need to address it has been rapidly accelerated. And numerous governments are bringing in green policies. I partly live in Germany and 40 billion of the German Euro, 40 billion of the German recovery program is linked to grey green issues. And BP, for example, wrote off recently $17 billion worth of assets because of the fact they recognise that oil is going to be left in the ground. So if you're a fuel retailer, this is a massive challenge for you. Um, but in any other retailer, uh, then this is a critical issue which you really need to be aware of how your customers are seeing the climate crisis and what you can do about that. On plastic, there's no doubt that plastic as an issue has gone backwards, um, that uh, the customers are sort of have taken their focus off it. I still don't think the fundamental problem has gone away. And I still think, I know my customers, um, why they maybe not so focused on it the last six months, will certainly in, in, in the future be looking 
to that, that, that nothing has fundamentally changed on that. I think there are two other things we need to be aware of. One is the whole obesity issue and diet. Um, as food retailers, uh, I believe we have a responsibility. And I had a, a, a call from the National Pharmaceutical Association yesterday who are looking to pull together a national sort of healthier eating program and wanting to work with retailers on that. So while it may not be our job to tell people they're obese and too fat and need to stop, uh, you know, to change the diets, we certainly can play a role in, in um, how they, uh, how, how we communicate to our customers around food. And then the final thing very quickly is demographics, whereby, you know, the changing demographics is changing people's needs and younger people have very different needs than, than sort of their older generations. So on the next slide, I want to talk about purpose for a second before I go into plastic. Um, because for me, I think, so our purpose is that we are the community supermarket that really cares about people and planet. And I feel that it's really important for a business to have a purpose and for everything you do to be associated with that purpose. And I think people, to do something like what we did in plastic, which I'm going to share with you in a minute, or to tackle some of the other issues I'm talking about, you really have to believe in it. And I think just doing lip service stuff that doesn't, that you don't really care, but you know, you've heard plastic, something you should do something about it. So let's give it a try. You won't succeed in doing so. Um, and I think it becomes really clear, particularly in this time with social media, that things that people do are genuine. So in the early days of COVID, Boohoo had some great publicity about various things they'd done, but actually fundamentally their, their business model seems to be flawed in that they seem to have no issue in not paying the minimum wage and you know uh, uh, all the controversies arisen out of that. So what I'm saying is it's really important, I believe, to have a purpose that you can stand behind if you're going to do something like this. It needs to be genuine. People can see through things that aren't genuine. Um, and so that's our purpose. And we've developed a concept called authentic leadership, which in simple terms allow people to be themselves. Um, it gives people a lot more freedom. We have a thing called self-leadership. And that's all important because we could not have done what we've done in plastic without that. So if you look onto the next slide, and I want to bring you back uh, two years ago, almost exactly, when we decided that we needed to do something about plastic. And working with the Plastic Planet, the, the social enterprise, we decided we would be the first country in the, sorry, the first store in the UK and the second in the world to introduce plastic-free zones. Well, the first to do plastic-free zones, a Dutch retailer had done a plastic-free aisle. We, we recognised that that wasn't very sensible because you need to have plastic free across all the different zones of the store. So starting in September 2018, we set the intention that in within uh, 10 weeks, we would launch uh, plastic free zones and we would launch 1500 plastic free products uh, across the store. Uh, we actually ended up achieving uh, 1800 plastic free lines. And then as I said, the, the point I made earlier about purpose and authentic leadership is that our team totally and utterly believed in what we were doing and therefore they ploughed through mountains to achieve what is a phenomenal result. And, and you can see looking at our fruit and veg department what plastic free looks like and you can see how beautiful it looks and actually how ugly plastic is. And that's the very first thing customers came in into our store. And we did this whole thing to help our customers reduce plastic but also to show the big retailers, it wasn't as difficult as they let it on to be. On the next slide, you can see uh, our plastic-free bacon. So as well as, so the first thing we did was with products like fruit and veg, where we could control the packaging, we then went and changed our mix. So we changed our mix from about 60% uh, pre-packed, 40% loose to 85% pre-packed, uh, sorry, 85% loose. So that was in our, our control. We then saw suppliers had plastic-free packaging, like this amazing bacon product, the best bacon I've ever tasted. Lots of dry packaged goods that were, um, that were available plastic-free. And we put them in zones and we labeled those zones plastic-free. So people could very clearly see that these were plastic-free areas. On the next slide, you can see bread. That was an interesting one. We moved all our bread from being in the plastic sleeve wraps that most of you use um, for bread into uh, paper. 
Moving on the next slide on fish, really simply, instead of putting it in, in flimsy paper and then a plastic bag, we wrapped it in stronger wax paper with the price label on it, so you didn't actually need to put it into a plastic bag. Then in November last year, we launched our, our zero packaging section. And on this slide, if you move on to the next slide, you can see the dry area. And on the next slide, you can see things like washing liquids and bath foams and all those sort of things. Um, so that's a very quick synopsis of the things that we did. So in summary, we looked at where we could control the packaging, like fruit and veg, like bread, like cheese, like our fish counter, and we changed that. We then look for outside suppliers of plastic-free goods, of which there are more and more. And there's a thing called the plastic-free mark from a plastic planet, which marks goods that are 99% plastic-free certified. And then the final thing we did is we brought them all together in zones and highlighted them using the point of sale material you can see. So if we look then at the final slide in terms of the results, what you can see is that uh, we launched with 1,800 plastic-free lines. Um, Pre-COVID, we were up to 2,600. Um, we definitely have stepped backwards, um, and that is just a, a feature of the world we're in at the moment. But we will, uh, when the time is right, be refocusing on, on looking at the next tranche of products. Now, what's really interesting for me in this is that our total store sales went up by 4% when we did this. So that's the total store sales. And that was as a result of consumers really guessing that this was uh, something they wanted and customers saying we are we're going to do more shopping here because we believe in what you're doing and i even had one customer who traveled an hour each way in a bus from south london to shop with us because of what we're doing so the summary really is uh, one other final thing is we had no re increase in food waste which is the main reason that lots of people said that you know oh we can't do plastic free and every single major multiple has been to see us and i certainly believe that being arrogant that we've influenced um, the likes of Tesco, Iceland, other people who've made huge steps in the kind of year, year and a bit from when we launched this in 2018 uh, through to the start of, of COVID. So I think the message is if you do the right thing for your customers, then you will get benefits. So thank you for listening. Great. Thanks, Andrew, for a really insightful tour through your journey to reducing plastic in your store. Um, I think that this is going to help to show other retailers that it is possible, potentially, um, and hopefully this Q&A session will also draw that out and build on that as well. Um, so the question that I think retailers are probably wondering is, where do I start? Um, so, Andrew, we saw that you started out with fresh and changing your mix to loose before moving on to different zones. Do you have a sense of where retailers should go first and where they should go next, building on the experience that you've got, having started out as one of the only people sort of doing this in the country? Um, definitely, the, the things that you can control yourself are the easiest things to do. Um, and that that is like fruit and veg, bakery, or probably two of the, the easiest wins. Um, and then combined with buying in products that other suppliers produce that are plastic free. And there is a remarkable number of products out there now that are plastic free, either that have the plastic free mark from a plastic planet or don't, but are plastic free. Um, and, you know, a lot of them are from smaller specialist organizations. None of the really big suppliers, you know, there are one or two products, but mostly they are quite a bit behind. Um, so I would buy in what you can and tackle things like produce and bread you can do yourself. And it's amazing how quickly you could get a, a very decent, section of plastic free a few sections of plastic free in your store if you set your mind to it yeah um and it's remarkable that you said that you sort of changed so many lines within a space of about 10 weeks do you think that this is something that's feasible for um lots of independent stores yeah i think so and when we we we've been very open source about what we're doing uh working with the plastic planet and we are happy to share and, and they are happy to share databases and so on of products things that we've done things that have worked, things that haven't worked and so on. So that, you know, we have, we were starting from scratch because no one had done this before. Whereas, you know, for anybody else who wants to do it, they can very quickly piggyback on um, the work we've done and the products we've done and seen how, what we've learned and so on. So I think that's very achievable. But as I said earlier, I think you, you really have to, it has to fit with your purpose. It has to fit with something that's important to you because otherwise it took, it was a huge amount of hard work. And it wasn't me who did the hard work. I'm the one who sits and takes all the glory. 
you know, the 85 people in the store, a number of them worked incredibly hard to do this. Um, and I think uh, if you are committed to it, then it is possible and it makes a difference. And customers really, really, our customers really valued it. And they rewarded us as uh, in sales terms, as well as just in sort of general loyalty. Great. Um, purpose is something I'd really like to come back to um, later. But firstly, I'm going to go to Rachel. Um, you're a fuel retailer and also we know that there are sort of additional challenges with the environment crisis and also your stores based outside of London and Lincolnshire. So perhaps this might work a little differently for you. Um, interested to hear sort of how your experience has differed and if there's also a sense of products that you have that work and don't work. Thanks. I've got a, a huge admiration for what Andrew's done, but we've taken a, a bit of a different tack, really. We've gone a little bit more softly, softly, um, going for easy wins, things that we can affect very quickly. Small things like charging for plastic bags, even though we don't need to because we've got less than 250 staff, that's reduced the, the, the packaging of the plastic bags and everything. Um, we've swapped out the plastic spoons that we give away with yogurts for wooden ones not everybody likes them but they are there and we're not offering the plastic ones anymore you know we've given our staff um keep cups for them to have their own coffee in rather than using disposable ones and and lots of things like that we we are doing um some package free products but in a petrol station it is more difficult um customers are not so keen in that environment on things that aren't packaged in the same way they like things to be wrapped and you do find you get a lot of people who won't pick up something that's that's unwrapped even fruit and veg because it's in a petrol station it shouldn't make a difference but unfortunately it does and we are in a very different demographic now we've tried the the dry goods in pods and some of them are working really well so for us the snacking products like um, banana chips and um, rice crackers those sorts of things sell very well but we tried lentils and raisins and we had some issues with actually getting the, the wet goods out of the pods the raisins and dried apricots and things just you know are an issue they don't come out very easily they get stuck um, and our customers just aren't ready for brown rice and lentils in in pods. And I think they might sell quite well in a health food store or somewhere locally. But for us in a petrol station, it doesn't work. So we're actually moving ours from the grocery area. So they're all in the snacking area and, and doing a wider range of snacking. But that's a lot to do with our customers and the people mm that are shopping with us and what they are buying you know essentially although we're seeing huge growth in growth uh, growth in grocery sales we are still selling more soft drinks and sandwiches and confectionery and crisps because of the nature of what we do and how we do it yeah and as you say people might be looking more for the sort of things that they can grab and go on the go in that sort of specific retail environment I do think yes. that um, the refillable stations are one of the things that we've sort of seen coming up more and more and one of the things that retailers might have heard about. Um, I'm interested to hear from James from Loco Soco, who are looking to meet some of these sustainability challenges. Um, a bit more about some of the other products that people can use and what the sort of sustainable solutions that they might not have thought of are. Yeah, uh, um, for us, yeah, we've seen um, we've seen a lot of success over the past six months in uh, refillable cleaning products. Uh, uh, we're in about two hundred and fifty shops at the moment, and we're just about to start extending that from cleaning products to um, hair repair and body washes, shampoos, conditioners, laundry liquids. Um, and there's a lot, lot, lot of appetite for that. I think one of the interesting things that's happened over the last six months is actually suppliers like ourselves being able to get the component parts. Has really like for the you know for trigger heads and uh, bottle caps has made it you know even more essential that we sort of look towards these refill solutions, um, you know. But also where we where there's products that are you know in recycled plastic packaging, you know, that either come from uh, post consumer plastic or they come from ocean plastic, um, you know. But the other side of it is is actually on the the ones what we do from concentrate where you know effectively you're not paying to transport water across the country because you can fill it up at home. So I think there's lots of exciting things coming to market um, and there'll be uh, many from us over the coming months and years. Yeah. Great, and I think that Rachel, you have refillable water in store um, as right. 
Uh, how has that been working for you? Have customers responded well to that? Customers have responded in a fantastic way to it. There's been a huge social media presence from it and customers absolutely love it but they're not actually using it very much. They, they like the fact that it's there. They, you know, are talking about it. They're saying how great that you've got it. But actually, there's very few people using it. The staff are far better hydrated than they ever have been. Um, but yes, it's a it's a filtered water station that we've got. The water in our area is disgusting if you drink it straight out of the tap. Um, but we're also selling bottled water that comes in glass bottles and in aluminium cans and you know we're offering recycling facilities for aluminium cans um all of the aluminium's going to build platforms for helipads for hospitals for you know the um air ambulances and things so we're, we're trying to do lots of small things small wins that are helping you get to the long-term goal um but you know, we'd, we'd like to do a bit more. And I think, as Andrew was saying, COVID has interrupted what we were doing and how we were doing it, particularly the amount of plastic gloves that we're using, which are the most revolting things on the planet, really. And they're really not good. And I don't want to be using them or throwing them away, but we are using a lot more. So. I do think that, yeah, COVID's impacted quite a lot of areas in this. Obviously, people aren't really using reusable cups. Uh, coffee cups anymore there's lots of single use masks so it's important that we're still sort of driving forward and, and innovating in other ways um and i think that loco soco have uh had a lot of success with that in the past few months in terms of offering the hand sanitizer stations quickly um how have you found working with retailers and implementing those in store have they been well received uh, yeah, yeah, it's been um, it's been really fantastic. We're um, we're quite fortunate to have a really lively WhatsApp group with many of the uh, top retailers in the country. And you know, over the past six months, you know, we've never a, a cleaning product company, but um, it became very uh, apparent that you know there was a need for this in the community. And uh, our retail partners have been absolutely uh, epic, should I say, in you know going right. This is what we need. Can you can you please get on top of this? Um, you know, it's, it's led to you know some really decent business for us. Um, and just sort of solidifying those relationships, not only with the retailers, but in, in communities themselves. You know, we're sort of hoping to, to build on that so that we can promote more sustainable messages and um, opportunities for them to purchase you know, different things going forward, you know, be it toothbrushes um, that was made out of bamboo, you know, be sort of um, instead of using scourers, using a, a bamboo brush again. Um, you know, I think it's, I think over the coming months and years, you know, there's so many innovations coming to market. And having that solid relationship with these retailers, they're the, they're the ones at the heart of the community that can help actually drive that message home. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, um, it's been a, a good time in, in the terms of you know onboarding retailers. Um, but now you know the challenge ahead is you know, is getting more sustainable products out there. Yeah, and um, so there's much more obviously to offer now than just refill stations, hand sanitizer dispensers, but lots of lines for food as well um, and water. Um, Andrew, how did you go about finding the supplies for your various products? You mentioned the Plastic Planet. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how you came to know about that? Yeah, Plastic Planet is a, is a charity that's focused on reducing our, all of our addiction to plastic. Um, they worked with Echo Plaza, the Dutch retailer I mentioned in my presentation, who did this Plastic Free Aisle. And when, as soon as we saw that, we, we were inspired by what they did. Um, so they were really, really helpful because they spent, we had one of their people, we got some funding and um, some sponsorship to put one of their people in our store for four or five months. Um, and because of what they do, they kind of, they're connected to, they know everybody who, who is producing alternative materials. And um, so they were really helpful. I mean, now that we've built, we, have, we, we are now known in this space. So we get approaches directly from new suppliers all the time. Um, but certainly in the early days, they were very, very helpful. Um, and there was quite a lot of trial and error. I mean, for example, with the bread, we started, um, initially we weren't putting enough paper on the bread, so it was being exposed and it was going stale, so that affected sales. Then we put too much paper on it, uh, and people didn't like that because they couldn't see it, so that affected sales. So there was quite a bit of playing around to get the right level of, of um, paper on, 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 on the product. So there was some trial and error there as well. Um, and Rachel, how did you go about finding the suppliers for your products? And also interested to hear um, if or how this affects your wholesale contract. Well, actually, Blakemore's were very helpful. They found the initial supplier for us for the dry goods for our pods. 
um, you know, they negotiated a, a contract on our behalf for that and for a couple of other stores. Um, but actually, in general, I've gone to our existing suppliers and asked them for a more environmentally friendly product. So I've said, look, I've this is what I've been buying for you. Do you do one that's recyclable or biodegradable or compostable or, you know, what are my other options? And in most places I've found that, you know, paper straws instead of plastic ones, those small things, um, not for slush, doesn't work for slush because they just go gooey. Um, but, you know, dealing with the existing suppliers is usually doesn't make it much of a problem. And, a lot of our local suppliers, harping back to the, the previous um, uh, topic, um, are much more environmentally friendly anyway. The, the small companies are very hot on, mm. you know, cardboard instead of plastic and, and those sorts of things. And if you're dealing with a local supplier, it doesn't affect your wholesale contract at all with a symbol group. They're keen for you to work with local suppliers. So, you know, those those things are egg supplier is three miles up the road so you've got less food miles as well as you know reducing your plastic because it's in a cardboard container so really that this finding the suppliers hasn't been terribly tricky it's finding the products that are tricky to replace so things like slush straws that you know is one of those things it's very difficult to get right and and the gloves there are some biodegradable ones out there but they're not very good and they're excessively expensive and it's always a trade-off between the economics of something and um you know wanting to do the right thing and if it's going to cost you 10 percent, you don't more you don't worry about it. if it's going to cost you 20 percent more you've got to think about it if it's more than that you really got to decide whether that's the right thing or whether you should tackle something easier to start with and then go back to the more difficult things as you go along. Yeah. So this is really helpful in understanding sort of which products you should start with, what you should move on to next and how you can control more up the supply chain, sort of speaking to your suppliers and asking if they do have an alternative. It's a really good proactive way to sort of start the conversation. Yeah, um, I've had a question from um, the audience. So in the short term, what's COVID's effects? Are refill stations used and are people afraid of loose produce? Um, are bags for life not used? And if so, how will this recover? So really a question about, I guess, the hygiene element or people not wanting to use sort of loose products like that. Um, Andrew first and then Rachel, have you sort of seen an effect in the short term in this area? Uh, yes, we have... You know, we had um, a, an olive bar, which was open, that, that then you could put the, the olives into compostable containers. We've had to stop doing that. We also had a salad bar with lots of open, big piles of salads, which people didn't help themselves, but were served. And we've moved into pre-packed, again, in, in, in compostable uh, packaging. Um, and I think the loose, the dried snacks and lentils and so on and so forth, that certainly came off a little bit it it's coming back up again um so it has an impact there's no question about it and as rachel said all the disposable gloves and stuff like that so there's no there's no question it's had an impact and we've had to introduce more pre-packed produce because there's just you know some people who are you know mostly we're still we're still 75 to 80 percent loose and in fact what a lot of people really valued particularly in the early days of of, of, of COVID that actually we, you know, when lots of people didn't have any stock, we had loads and loads of, and people could buy just the quantities they wanted to. They weren't being forced to buy, you know, you know, we have a lot of single households in our areas, either young people or old people. Uh, and they felt they're, you know, being forced to buy a, a six pack. They don't want six pack of apples because they're living on their own. They only want to buy two apples. So uh, yeah, it's definitely taken a hit. And, uh, but I think that will come back in time. Yeah, we've we've seen it take a hit as well, and and logistically it's been difficult um, mm. because it was so busy on the shop floor. Getting onto the shop floor to refill the pods and things was difficult because you were having to to barrier yourself in and you know keep yourself protected. Our snacking pods are in our food to go area, which is also where the coffee machine is and where the water station is and we were finding that the queues for different things were merging into one and causing all sorts of problems so it, it, there were things we just switched off slush for example we just switched it off 
we just took it out switched off because we couldn't we couldn't get enough people in the area safely and because those pods are in that area too it did cause a problem and as when I said I we were hoping to move the grocery ones into the snacking area that we just can't do at the moment because you can't get to it safely because there's still a queue for the coffee machine most of the time. Yeah, and I think that we do often hear about sort of the trade-offs between managing, reducing uh, plastic in store and then sort of other things. Um, do you... The bags for life are interesting, actually, because I think we've increased the use of bags for life. I think customers are wanting to touch their own bags and not have anybody else touch their bags. And so they're bringing them in more. Yeah. Um, Got a question for Andrew. Why do you think it is that you haven't seen an increase in food waste since switching your lines to plastic free? Is there sort of a, a secret to your success in this area? Or do you think that a lot of retailers hesitation in this area is sort of less founded? I, I think um, there's a couple of things. I think, um, and I've talked with other retailers, I've talked with multiple soups, is seen when they've in produce a big increase in, in, in waste. I think two things. First of all, we saw because the display looks so amazing and so abundant, we actually saw an uptake in volume. And of course, you drive volume forward, then it actually helps you with waste. Um, and the second thing then is we were very careful about the quantity we, we, we had on display. Um, I was with a, a multiple uh, and what they had done is they had had uh, where they were trying out plastic free. Uh, and they had like used to have something like eight or nine varieties of mushrooms pre-packed. They'd gone down to two loose but they kept the same amount of space. So they just had way, way too much space for the product and therefore they were getting a lot of waste. So I think you've got to be really careful. And we, we changed some of our fixturing. Um, when you can't see the slide now, but on the right hand side, when you come in that section, we, we, we put some fixturing that took a lot less product that looked really abundant, but took less stock. So we are filling up often and keeping it. So we're not, we're not having these huge big, containers that are filled and then you know we don't sell you know we're not we can't sell the quantity of it so I think those are the two key things that we've done that's different to what other people have done that have, have contributed to the, the fact we haven't had an increase in food waste we're actually in a reduction um, yeah we have to it's really interesting I think it's sort of different from what people might expect um yeah. James when you're working with retailers this are these sort of some of the common hesitations that you hear or are there other sort of challenges? Oh, sorry, it, it, it just got out there. Uh, Great. Um, um, we, it's, it's funny, we get, um, we get a lot of retailers um, asking us to not, um, you know, not use plastic when we're, we send it, when we're boxing things up and send them. And, and the same for a lot of the, the groups in their places of worship and other community organisations that we service, they can actually make a request in the notes, you know please limit the plastic as much as possible for us. Uh, so it's definitely a growing trend. Great, um, so to close up then, I want to um, sort of highlight that obviously there's a number of challenges. So I think it's important to draw on Andrew's point about purpose. Um, so I'll come to Rachel first. Um, what was the sort of main purpose for you? Um, was the motivation sort of driven by customer demand or is there a personal sort of motivation for you wanting to move your store? in this direction? Definitely a personal motivation for me, I'm afraid. Um, I'm sure that customers do like it and, and there is a benefit from a customer perspective, but actually I'm just doing it because I think it's the right thing to do. Great. Um, and Andrew, we've sort of obviously already heard quite a bit about um, your purpose. Um, do you um, think that there's any sort of other final tips that you have for retailers and considering when reducing plastic in their store? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what Rachel said about, about you know, doing because you want to do it. Um, and we kind of did it because we could, you know, we're in a position to do it. Other final tips, I think just decide and just do it. I mean, we had some pushback. People were saying, oh, well, you know, can we delay it a bit? We're not going to be ready in time. And I just said, look, it doesn't matter how many we launch with. We're going to launch it on, we were going to launch it on Guy Fawkes Day. We thought that would be quite funny. But in the end, it's... Not a good day for a press launch, apparently it was a Monday, so we did it on the Thursday. Um, so I would just say, just say, right, we're going to do it and we're going to launch it in this amount of time and just go for it. I think these are, sometimes you can overthink these things and you can spend too long thinking and planning and what we're going to do and so on and actually not do anything. Great. 
Um, well, thank you very much to Andrew, Rachel and James. Um, if you have any other unanswered questions for us, we'll be in the networking room um, at quarter two. Um, and also thank you very much again to our sponsor, Loco Soco, and we'll see you shortly.